So we have had Sanskrit curriculum that we've used over the years, and this is a, an expanded course offering. We are trying to put a bit more in the course than we have had previously. And the windows are behaving funny. Um, all right, I'm just gonna have to get that out of the way. So basically this is the introductory presentation on Sanskrit. So what's the reason? Why are we covering Sanskrit? Um, you know, as you probably know, Sanskrit is the common language for Ayurvedic terms. It often carries specific and multi-layered meanings, and sometimes these meanings are difficult to translate succinctly. For example, you know, we can say ahara is uh, nutrition, but really ahara um, implies quite a bit more. It means literally what you take in. Vihara, we can say vihara is what you do for recreation, but really there's a bit more to that. It's, it's how you divert yourself, how you relax. Uh, you know, recreation is not a bad word really because it has that connotation of recreating, rebooting yourself. Um, Sanskrit also carries meanings of core concepts amongst the global Ayurveda community. And there's, there should be a little loss of translation. If people have a common understanding of these terms, they should really be able to, um, you know, grasp what we're talking about. All of the source texts of Ayurveda are written in Sanskrit. So Sushruta Samhita, Charaka Samhita, um, Madhavanandan, these are all written in Sanskrit. There are commentaries that are written in Sanskrit. It's a very common thing when you have, um, because sometimes, we're gonna talk about this, sometimes the verses that are used to write concepts are very dense in meaning and someone will write a commentary on it. Then commentary will give an expanded meaning, but those commentaries are also in Sanskrit. So when someone gives a translation of a text, they may, uh, when, and meaning translating into English, they may often refer to the original text plus a commentary. And the commentator is usually someone who is either uh, you know, who's very nearly a contemporary of the author or who has studied the author's work in a, um, you know, in a traditional setting. Now, that's an important thing to understand because sometimes people look at Sanskrit and they say, wow, why would things be written in a rather difficult language? And Sanskrit is not an easy language. It's very dense. It has a lot of information density. But try to understand that a lot of the uh, tradition in uh, Vedic sciences was oral. So one was expected to not run around with a book to look things up in. You were expected to have all these things in your head and be able to refer instantly to you know, many thousands of references. So Sanskrit has a lot of density because you can memorize a fair amount of Sanskrit text and have a very large uh, capacity of information ready to hand. Another example of this is in Nyaya. In the Nyaya Sutras, there is a lot of density of information that's given in the form of sutras. A sutra is a very short um, a little expression or aphorism, and it packs a lot of meaning into the minimum number of words. So sutra, and actually I think I've got that mentioned here in the slide. Um, so but getting back to what I'm explaining, <clears throat> traditionally the way that you learn something um, is, you know, it's, you don't go in a big college that has, you know, big 
halls and ivory towers and all that. It might, it might just be a teacher who lives in a hut in a village somewhere, but they have a vast knowledge. They have studied and they have heard the, the knowledge of Ayurveda from a guru and um, there's, a, there's a concept and the Sanskrit word is parampara. Parampara, um, uh, let me put that down. Parampara means a succession. So uh, there's a succession of, um, of students who have very faithfully understood the topic from a guru who um, himself or herself has also very faithfully studied the topic with a great respect for the original intention of the author. And that is, that's the way that many fields of knowledge have been handed down. So Sanskrit makes a lot of sense for that. So the commentators of source texts will also have written in Sanskrit based on perhaps a lifetime of studying the particular subject so that this will help another person who may not have the benefit of all that study to understand the, the dense meaning that is expanded somewhat. So critical concepts in Sanskrit are expressed in verses and sutras. Um, a verse in particular has rhythmic patterns, and these rhythmic patterns aid in memorization. Um, you know, so uh, for example, there's a um, um, one verse from um, Bhagavad Gita. Uh, well, let, let me give you an example, a verse from the Bhagavata Purana. Nigamakalpatarogalatam palam shukamukha damratat dravasam yutam pibata bhagavatam rasamalayam muhuraho rasika bhuvipavukha. So it is a it is a third verse of the first canto of the of the, the uh, Srimad Bhagavat Purana. You can hear the rhythmic pattern there in that verse. There's actually a name. I think that that meter is called Drutabilambata. Um, it's a very beautiful pattern, but it also aids in memorization because people who've studied memory and the way that things are memorized have understood that. Um, we follow different types. Uh, there are different ways in which we learn things. And Sanskrit, especially Sanskrit, which is written in verse form, it tends to leverage at least three or sometimes four of the different aspects of learning. It can leverage rhythm. It can leverage movement because there's an implied dance in the pattern of the meter, it can leverage music in learning because you can also sing this. And and so you have also the, the sounds in themselves as they are strung together. Uh, there's the sound aspect and there's also a visual aspect because you can write this down. Even though Sanskrit is really originally and primarily oral, um, it also has a written tradition. And Sanskrit is a core language. So, uh, you know, Sanskrit words are derived from other Sanskrit words. Now, this is something that we are really want to try in this particular module. We want to try to go into a little bit more depth than we've done previously. Previously, we've had about a 10 or 20 hour coverage of Sanskrit. Uh, now we're, we're giving it about a, a 25 to 50 hour coverage. And I wanna go in a little bit more detail and cover some of the derivations. You know, for example, how do we get Ayurveda from Ayus, plus Veda. And how does Veda come from vid to understand? The verbal root vid is to understand, uh, to know, as in to know a science. So how does that happen? 
Um, how do we get Ayurveda from that? There are rules that we use and Sanskrit is full of rules. Um, it's it's almost it's in one sense it's almost more like learning a programming language than learning learning a uh, learning a, a regular language because it, it does have a lot of rules. That's one reason why doing a full on study of Sanskrit I would say to get a reasonable proficiency it's about twelve hundred hours of study. It's about a twelve hundred hour language. You know that people use a kind of an estimate of how many hours you put into a language before you get proficiency um, in it. And some languages are notoriously more difficult than others. Um, you know, Russian is a notoriously difficult language right? because it has several different uh, nominal cases. It has many different verbal tenses. There are many ways. Um, you know, it's it's not a it's not a simple language. You know, Spanish is at the other end. It's it's a very easy language to learn, especially if you already speak a language that has a lot of Latin basis. Um, you can pretty much pick up Spanish just from you know hearing things translated. Uh, at least that's how I learned it. I, my Spanish is still pretty bad, but you know it it wasn't that hard to pick up. But um, Sanskrit was a, was really a bit of a job to work, to learn thoroughly. But in any case, what we want to try to do for you is we want to help you with Sanskrit in terms of understanding how things basically work so that it's a little bit less of a mystery. How on earth did you come up with this from that? You know, that's, that's one of the things that, that can be just a little baffling sometimes. And we're also in our materials, we're trying to be more standardized in our use of diacritics. And we really want all of our instructional materials to be a reference that you can use and you can actually keep with you as you are practicing Ayurveda and you can refer back to it that, that should help you as you continue to learn. Because you can be continuing to learn Ayurveda for the next 10 or 20 years. You know, you can get uh, texts like Sushruta Samhita, Charaka Samhita, Madhavanada, and others, and you can go through them on your own. But having some knowledge of Sanskrit is actually going to help you. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's going to help you in understanding some of the translations that are out there, believe it or not. So what are the goals? What are the things that we want to do in this module? So we're going to spend about, about 50 hours total. That's not going to be the time in presentations. That's going to be the total time that you spend on forums and exercises and so forth. If we were going to properly cover Sanskrit, it's about a two-year college course. It's, it's more work than, the, than you know, to go through the, <coughs> the, entire, um, the entire second, the entire two phases of doing Ayurveda counselor and Ayurveda practitioner. Um, maybe just a little less. Uh, some, I think some people would even argue for Sanskrit being a 2,000 study hour language. Um, I'm going to say it's probably around 1,200 study hours just to have a reasonable proficiency to be able to translate some basic things. You know, previously we had Sanskrit materials that provided some pronunciation basics, a few core concepts and vocabulary. You may see a lot of that material out there. Um, you know, this is, um, it, it's not going to, in, it's not entirely intended to replace all that. In particular, we have um, a lot of vocabulary lists out there, but, you know, we're, we're trying to go about it in a little bit more of a systematic way here. So we're going to expand on that. We're going to explain things like Sunday. Sunday is the joining of words. So for example, <clears throat> we have Sharirendriya Satvatma. What is that? How do we get Sharira, Sharirendriya Satvatma? Well, Sharira is the body. And when we add Indriya, the senses, we get Sharirendriya. And I'm doing this here without diacritics. <coughs> so you see, you know, there's an example. Um, and then sattva atma. So sattva. Whoops. Sattva meaning mind plus atma meaning the soul is sattva atma. And that's a long A. I'm not putting it in here because I'm just typing it. I don't have my diacritic macros here. This is Sandhi. 
Um, the, another form, another way that Sunday happens is Ayus plus Veda equals Ayurveda. That is another example of Sunday. That's internal Sunday. So we have Sunday, and then um, we also will go through some examples of Anvaya, which is when we do Anvaya, we give synonyms, and there are some of the existing Sanskrit materials that do have some examples of key verses with the Anvaya, with the synonyms. Now, synonyms or Anvaya is a common thing that's done in in books where we're giving a translation of Sanskrit to English and where we really want you, the person who's reading the book, to have a very clear idea of how we are presenting the original text. So when the original text is technical in nature or it's about some philosophical thing, we really want to make sure that there's not, you know, that you don't feel like we've just interpreted it some way and we also want you to understand how the words in the text got broken up because this, this thing, Sunday, it's something that, you know, we give examples like these and they seem very easy, but there are actually a few hundred rules of Sunday and they can be a little daunting and the difficult part in Sunday is breaking them up. When we do Anvaya, we're breaking up the Sunday for you. So, you know, if we do un, uh, the Anvaya, we would break up Sharira and Indriya into the components. So you don't have to look at Sharira and Indriya and think, well, how, was that Sharira plus Indriya? Oh, right, it is, because I can read the synonyms, the Anvaya. We'll talk about also Samas, compound words, which we use a lot of, and some of the basic elements of grammar. We're not going to try to go too deeply into it. Sanskrit has uh, seven nominal cases, nominative, accusative, dative, instrumental, ablative, genitive, locative, and there is also a vocative, a form of address called sambodhan, making a total of eight. It has three numbers, singular, dual, and plural, and it has three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter. <clears throat> so, you know, there are many, <coughs> many Indo-European languages that are, that are similar. Um, Latin, Russian, Greek, uh, ancient Greek, they all have, um, you know, a, uh, a similar level of complexity um, and, you know, and, and not using uh, prepositions as much as actually having different forms of the words. If you do want to really dive into a serious study of Sanskrit grammar, you know, we, we can try to help, try to provide guidance, but, you know, if you do want to do that, you can expect to spend some serious time doing it. Um, I initially did my, you know, initial learning of Sanskrit. It, well, I did learn on my own. Um, I did audit some, some courses at Columbia, um, and that was helpful just to get me jump started. But really, most of what I did was self study over the course of about a year. But in that year, I probably put in about 1,500 to 2,000 hours of study. Um, I was just not really doing much other than I was cooking in the ashram and I had a book and I would just dive into it. And um, I had a lot of fun. So I was very motivated. But, you know, again, I would say. Count on spending maybe 1,200 hours plus before you really feel like you're getting off the ground. So it's not, it's not easy. All right, so. So what are some of the texts, texts that define Sanskrit? Here we go. Um, so a very good dictionary that I recommend is the, uh, this thing is giving me a hard time, the Practical Sanskrit English Dictionary by V.S. Opte. Um, I highly recommend this. It, the print quality varies. It was printed in letterpress in the early 1900s, and you would need to learn to read Devanagari's script um, but you can buy reprints of it on Amazon. 
It's about 1,100 pages in large format, and it has supplements on prosody, et cetera. Um, I recommend this. There are others that are popular, such as M. Monier Williams and um, McDonnell, um, and there are a few others out there as well. I really recommend uh, Professor Opde's dictionary because he was a, um, a you know a, a scholar from Varanasi, and he had knowledge of Nyaya and Ayurveda and Alankar, and really he fit the description of a traditional um, highly learned pundit. Um, and um, I really like his dictionary. And if you're serious about Sanskrit, it's, 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 it's a good thing to have. Even if you just occasionally, if you feel like you're going to put enough in to learn to read Devanagari and you want to have a Sanskrit dictionary around to look things up, I recommend it. It's not the neatest dictionary. It's not the prettiest one out there. Mine is falling apart a little bit. And I do have other dictionaries as well. I have M. Monier Williams and I have McDonnell. Um, and I have others as well, but this is, this is my go-to dictionary, and I, I recommend it. There are many self-study books, um, and there are books that are meant to be used in advanced high school or college study courses. Um, I like to recommend uh, the Sanskrit Grammar for High Schools by um, R. Antoine. Um, it was published in 1925. Um, he was a teacher at St. Xavier's University in Calcutta. It's currently in the public domain. You can get it in PDF. You can also buy printed versions of it. It comes in two books, book one and book two. Um, I would say the book one is about maybe a six-month study, and the book two is about a good year and a half worth. Um, the book two is, is a much more dense um, form but it's it's actually fun it gives you translation exercises translate this into from sanskrit to english translate this from english to sanskrit so it's actually um you know i think it's good it's not dumbed down and it's um it, it it's very fun traditional sanskrit grammar is defined in a book called panini vyakarana as sutras so there are sanskrit books of sutras that define Sanskrit grammar traditionally. Now, I did not learn Sanskrit grammar this way. I learned from this book, in fact. Um, this is the traditional way. There are a lot of things in Sanskrit that are defined using Sanskrit sutras. Um, and that's just part of, you know, the, the kind of density of information of Sanskrit and the way that it um, that it has been propagated over the years. Okay. So what is Sanskrit? Sanskrit is a phonetic language. You can represent Sanskrit using these Roman letters with diacritics. Now that is called I-A-S-T. Uh, this is something that dates back to, I think it was sometime back in the 1940s. IAST is the Indian, um, uh, I should remember what that acronym stands for. Um, it's an international standard for representing um, the sounds in Indic languages. And we're going to talk about those sounds in a little bit. But you can represent Sanskrit using any form you like. You can use these, the IA, what we call IAST, these Roman letters with diacritics. Like we've got this, you know, the line over the A in Devanagari, that is a diacritical mark. It's called a macron, and the A with a macron over it is ah. It's a long, uh, it's long. The a uh in Deva is short. So a, uh, ah. And then you have E in Devanagari. And there's no accentuation. There's only a flow of long and short syllables. You can also represent Sanskrit in Devanagari script, of course. And you can also use other scripts from India, such as Bengali. Um, I say specifically scripts from India because almost all Indic languages have similar sounds, including the Dravidian languages, such as Tamil. Tamil has other sounds like the uh, 
Uh, there are other sounds that are not found in Sanskrit, but it represents all the sounds, all the exact sounds found in Sanskrit. Now, when I say exact, there is actually an exact way that you are supposed to pronounce. So the pronunciation is far more important than the written form. So Sanskrit is a language that has a high information density. So rather than understanding verses as a stream of words, <coughs> verses are often decoded, and giving a literal translation can be quite confusing. Now, this is a very important point. You know, so for example, if I have a verse, so, you know, Sharirendriya Sattvatma, this is a good example. Sharirendriya Sattvatma Samyogo Dhari Jeevatam Life is said, the Ayu, the Ayu and Ayurveda, life Ayu is said to be the body, the senses, the mind, the soul, all in their functions as they work individually and collectively. Um, this is what is the Ayu in Ayurveda. Now, when I say it that way, hopefully it makes sense, but decoding that from the verse, the verse is kind of packed together. It's kind of like, you know, when you get, when you have a file on your computer and it's zipped up and you open the zip file and you've got, you know, maybe a five megabyte zip file and you open it up and you've got 28 megabytes of, of pictures and movies and things inside it. It's kind of how Sanskrit verses are. They can be little zip files and you have to sort of decode them. It can be somewhat headache inducing um, if, you don't, if you're not used to it or if you don't enjoy doing that. Now, the reason I mention this is if you, there are a lot of really excellent translations of ancient Ayurvedic texts. And the people who have translated, these are, pundits who have been studying these things all their life. And they know far more about the Sanskrit that's used in Ayurveda than little old me, for example. But their English is not so great, and they will give things in a very literal way. Um, I, I do have another presentation where I give some examples. I'm probably going to expand on those examples, because I think this is going to be one of the key goals of this module. I would really like to help you when you get your hands at some point as a serious Ayurvedic practitioner, you really do want to get your hands on some of these source texts. And when you do, I you know, want you to just be prepared for you know, trying to make sense of some of the, the translation styles because when they're very literal and they're trying to use one English word for one Sanskrit word, the result can be very hard to decode. So we want to try to help you with that, at least try to understand, um, you know, what's going on. And then your, your response might be, well, I'm going to have to ask a tool or somebody because this is, I just not making sense. We really are trying to uh, also provide translations of some of these core texts. Eventually, um, one of the, the projects I would really like to do, if we ever have time, I would really like to publish editions of some of these source texts with proper unvaya or synonyms and translations that I think will be um, easier to read, but completely 100% faithful to the original text. Sanskrit also has redundancy of information, especially when it's represented in verse form. So the Sanskrit word for verse is padya. The Sanskrit word for prose is gadya. A redundancy of information means that if there are some syllables which were incorrectly copied or transcribed, a knowledgeable reader would have a better chance of understanding what the original text was. And, of course, the Sanskrit name for the language is Samskrita. Um, so, shocker, Samskrita, Samskrit. Well, often the A on the end is dropped because it's a short syllable. So, Sanskrit, Sanskrit becomes Sanskrit. And Sanskrit, but it's not Sanskrit. 
it's Sanskrit, okay? So if you say Sanskrit, people should know what you mean. They should know that you mean this. Oh, Sanskrit language, yes, okay. But it's not Sanskrit, it's Sanskrit. What does Sanskrit mean? Sanskrit means something that is very properly formed, okay? It means something that's very highly refined and properly formed. That is Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit. Okay. Let's move on. So more about what is Sanskrit. So rather than using uh, letters, you know, an alphabet, you know, A, B, C, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, uh, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, the syllable or akshara is the basic unit of writing. This is an important concept. And this helps to make sense of some of the things that we do even in the transliteration, because in transliterating, we are using letters, we're using letters with diacritics, but Sanskrit is made up of syllables, okay? That's a very important thing to remember. It's not made up of letters, it's made of syllables. Why? Because it is a phonetic language. Um, you know, it, think about how you pronounce things. You don't say, but, oh, e, boy, you say, boy. Um, you know, or if I want to teach you to say a long word like sesquipedalian, I'll tell you, okay, sesquipedalian. It means a word that's a foot and a half long, literally. Well, that's really what it is. Sesqui is from Latin meaning one and a half. But okay, that's a long word. So I've broken it up into syllables. So we also use syllables in English as well. And syllables are also used in writing. So Devanagari is probably the most popular system for representing Sanskrit. Why? Because Devanagari is based on syllables and the syllables are composed with ligatures. Another language that uses composed syllables is the Hangul script. Hangul was invented in around, around 1500 um, in Korea for the Korean language. Um, now, interestingly, there was a lot of cross-pollination between Korea and India. There was a princess from Ayodhya who married in one of the early Korean dynasties. I really forget about what time that was, but it was uh, sometime, I believe, before the medieval period, maybe around 1100 AD or something like that. It was, it was going back quite a ways. So, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Devanagari um, separately. But the arrangement of syllables in Devanagari goes according to the parts of the mouth used for the consonants. And the consonants are arranged in rows and columns. We have columns that represent hard unvoiced, hard voiced, soft unvoiced, soft voiced, and nasal. We're going to talk about that in just a minute here in one of the next slides, and that should hopefully make more sense. The consonants are called vyanjanan, and each consonant has an implicit vowel. So for example, if we talk about ka, ka has an implicit a uh in it, okay? So, you know, ka, there is the uh, consonant ka, and we also have an implicit vowel. Now that's the unvoiced version, meaning it doesn't have breath in it, ka. If I say ka, I don't want to have breath coming out. If I hold my fingers in front of my mouth when I say ka, I shouldn't feel a puff of breath coming out. It should be very, very faint. Now, ka, on the other hand, ka, ka, I'm giving breath to it. Do you hear the difference? Now, Sanskrit also, remember that Sanskrit has this density of information. Um, and like in some, uh, in some Indic languages, such as in Hindi, for example, there are some words, and I am not going to give those as examples, but there are some words where using the uh, aspirate or unaspirate uh, voiced versus unvoiced version or using the dental versus the cerebral version of a letter makes it um, from a, an ordinary word into a really filthy, dirty word. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to give any examples of that. 
but you don't have that in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is actually organized in a way that you have very few words where just getting one letter wrong is going to make it a completely different word. It's very interesting. It has an interesting, what we call a, a um, entropic distribution in, in computer science. So vowels are called sweta. Um, sweta also means a sound like a musical note. Um, in, uh, in music, we have sa re ga ma pa da ni sa. Uh, those are also called sweta. The vowels in Sanskrit are called sweta. There are also four semi-vowels. There are three sibilants. We'll talk about that, those sibilant siblings in one of the next slides. And there's also one vocal fricative, ha, huh, which is just ha, 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 just as you might expect. And there's no big surprise there, ha, huh, ha, ha, ha. It's just as you might expect it to be. Now let's talk about some pronunciation. Um, so there are, let's, we're gonna talk about the simple vowels first. So the vowels or swara are very important because this is one of the key differences between Sanskrit and most other Indic languages and English is in the pronunciation of the vowels. And remember, there are vowels everywhere because every consonant has an implicit vowel. We can join many consonants together um, and make a vinjana yoga or a combination of consonants. But every consonant has an implicit vowel with it. So the vowels are important. So there are 10 swaras which come in pairs of long and short. So these are a, a, i, E, U, U, R, R, L, and L. Uh, I don't even have L represented. Um, it's almost never used. It's actually not even in the Unicode font digraphs. So these are all simple vowels. What do we mean by a simple vowel? The mouth does not change shape while uttering them. I'm gonna talk about your mouth moving a little bit here. So bear with me because this is very important. We're going back to the basics of how we pronounce things, okay? So let's try saying these together. Uh, so it's just a simple uh. It's like the uh in but, uh. And then ah. Uh. Now the ah, uh, you're opening your mouth wider. Sort of like, you know, you open your mouth and say, ah, i, it's sort of like the it in pin, i, and then e, e is twice as long. You're spreading your mouth a little bit more in a grin. U, it's like the u in push, especially for a British speech speaker, push. Um, u, lips are pushed out a little bit more. It's held twice as long. Re, is actually a vowel. It is not a combination. Um, it's a simple flick of the tongue against the alveolar ridge. It's that ridge behind the top front teeth. Now, is there a difference between r and uh, putting r and it together? There actually is. We'll talk about it later. For now, just remember that this is actually a vowel or swara. It's not a consonant. And don't worry about r you'll almost never see it. You, I, I really practically guarantee you can go through, um, I, don't, I, I don't even remember seeing it in any of the Ayurvedic texts. Of all the texts that I've gone through in Sanskrit and doing Sanskrit editing, I think I've run across maybe three or four times completely and never run across Ri other than in looking at a uh, you know, Sanskrit grammar where it's used as a symbol. <coughs> the long versions all have the macron over them and they're all twice as long as the short. So you can see, very simple. A, uh, a, uh, i, i, u, u, ri, ri. They all, the long versions all have a hat. They all have a macron on them. Okay, so that's actually pretty straightforward. The main thing is 
They're simple vowels. The mouth doesn't change shape when you're uttering them. That's something that takes a little bit of practice. It takes a little getting used to. Now let's talk about a and o. These are actually quite different. Now, in a quick guide to pronunciation, we might say that, oh, the uh, Sanskrit, the, the E in Sanskrit words like in Ayurveda is, it's kind of like the A in hey. Well, not really. It is, think about when we say, hey, hey, you, hey. And especially if someone is, is Southern, they might say, hey, hey, you. Um, it's really not at all like that. A, A, so A, try to say that, A. Here's how you do it. You go from ah, your mouth is open like you're saying ah, and then E, your mouth is spread in a grin. Now slide between them, I. Make a, think of a little diagram here. So we've got here the, um, we've got the ah, and then we've got the, we've got the E, and I'm just writing these as doubled letters because I don't have the diacritics here. And then um, I'm just making this sliding line. I'm going from one to the other, right? Ah, E, I, I, A, A. Okay, I'm stuck right here. I'm gonna stick right here in the middle, and this is where my a is, okay? So this is about where A comes, halfway between A ah and E, A, A. I don't move, that's the thing. So this is an exercise you can do. You can do the slide, the pronunciation, and then try to stop halfway, find that middle point. Well, it's not exactly in the middle um, of you know where your mouth is, but you can hear it. It's a. Now, this is also something that's true of ah. Ah is not like the A-W, the, the ah sound in law. You know, so we say lawyer. I'm going to go see my lawyer. I'm going to go see my lawyer. Now, if someone speaks Indic languages, they will say liar. I'm going to see my liar. We might think that's a little funny, but it, and it is kind of funny, isn't it? Um, but it is actually because there's a difference in the pronunciation. Almost all Indic languages, they actually have to use a different symbol in Devanagari for representing this aw sound in law because it doesn't exist in Indic languages. It's only in, you know, in the English name John, for example. Um, there is, to write that in, in Hindi, um, you have to do something like, you have to write the, you know, you can write the, the, um, oh, what is happening with this computer is acting a little weird. And there's a little funny hook symbol that they put above the letter like this to make this into, instead of ah, it's now, Ah, so like in like John will have this symbol over it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think I have a mouse, a dying mouse here that I'm dealing with. That's the problem. Anyway, so A is halfway between A ah and E. Now the same thing is true for O. You go from A ah to U. So let's take our little diagram here. And instead of having E, we have O. And then we're going to go ow, 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 oh, 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 I'm stuck. Oh, 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 I'm stuck. That's the sound that you're making. It's halfway between the mouth position does not change. It's not like in the English, go or slow. Oh, oh, oh. No, it's not oh, it's oh, oh. So you have to practice it. It's not 
a normal thing, at least for English speakers. I think there are some other languages that also have this O oh sound. Um, it is, again, common to Indic languages. Um, but it is not something that is that comes naturally in English. Both E and O are long. They have twice as long, they're twice as long as the short swaras like A uh, and E. Um, that will be more important when we talk about pronunciation of Sanskrit prosody or verse. And then let's talk about pronunciation of um, a few others. So we have um, I, Ao, Anuswar, and Visarg. I is a diphthong. Now, you know, actually the way that we pronounce some of the vowels in English, like I was talking about the A ah and La, that's actually a diphthong. Or O oh and slow, that's actually a diphthong. <clears throat> I is a diphthong, but instead of sliding, it's sort of a combination of I and E. I, except you don't, you're not really exaggerating. It's just I. And oh, also, it's a diphthong combination of A ah and U. Both I and O are long. I, O. When I and O are followed by visarg, this H with a dot under it, it means that we only echo the last component. So, you know, for example, um, I with a visarg after it would be Ihi. O with a visarg after it would be Ahu. Now, this visarg, H with a dot under it, it makes a slight echo of the previous swara. Or if it comes anywhere other than at the end of the line, a short glottal stop. Um, <clears throat> what's an example of that? Tata uh, shariram. Tata. So instead of saying tata shariram, I'm saying tata shariram. I'm just making a short stop. Almost like like I caught my breath. That's all. It's a very simple thing. Anuswar is the M with a dot over it. And it's a simple nasalization. Now there are some Sanskrit scholars that will treat its pronunciation more as a nasalization of the entire syllable, like the N in the French bon. And this is how Hindi handles it. In Hindi, when you have the anuswar that comes after a syllable, it nasalizes the whole syllable. Like in Hindi, ma, M, uh, which is written like this in Hindi. Um, and then the, the M is, has the, the, um, the dot over it, Anuswar. And that's pronounced ma. Um, the A-I in Hindi is actually, um, is, is more like uh, English a eh, than the I in Sanskrit. Um, and the Anuswar, the M with a dot over it, makes the syllable come out ma. And that's I in Hindi. <coughs> But usually the way we handle anuswar in Sanskrit is we treat the anuswar like a short m. So Sanskrit, instead of saying Sanskrit, we say Sanskrit. We're not trying to make it nasalized. We're not trying to make it like the N in the French bon. It's, it's just a simple m. And you find that uh, it, it occurs very frequently. Okay, so let's move on to the next. Now let's talk about the Vyanjana Varga, the groups of consonants. Now remember I said that consonants are arranged in rows and in columns. So they are arranged in groups according to the mouth part. So there are the gutturals first, or kantya in Sanskrit. Ka, Ka, ga, ga, na. So ka has no breath and ka has breath. So ka is the hard version. The same thing in the same part, the back of your mouth, the back of your throat, ga is soft. It's not hard. So do you see the, the, the similarity between ka, ka, ga, ga, na? They are all in the same part of your mouth. And so they are in a row. The columns are, these are hard with no breath. These are hard with breath. 
These are soft with no breath or, or unvoiced. These are soft with breath. And then these are the, the, what we call the class nasals. You, don't, you almost never see those at the beginning of a word unless it's na or ma. So you don't have to worry too much about you know, seeing this at the beginning of a word and worrying about how to say it. We're just showing these for the sake of completeness. So these are the gutturals, ka, ka, ga, ga, na, and then the palatals or talavya. They are pronounced on the palate, cha, cha, ja, ja, nya. So the cha, when you ever see a C in Sanskrit, um, you know, for example, um, if we talk about uh, twacha, the herb, or yeah, so twacha, the C is always, it's always pronounced like cha. It's like the C in Italian mostly. Uh, cha means that we're adding breath to it. Ja, ja, those are fairly straightforward. And then we have the cerebrals, the murdanyas. Da, ta, da, da, na. So da, da is pronounced with the tongue against the alveolar ridge. What's the alveolar ridge, you ask me? Well, I'm happy to tell you. The alveolar ridge is this little ridge of gum behind the top row of your front teeth. Okay, so, you know, if you put your tongue against the back of your front teeth and then you move it to where the gum is, there's a little ridge there, and that's where you pronounce these ta, ta, da, da, na. Normally, what we do in English, it's sort of halfway between the dentals or dantya and the uh, cerebrals or murdanya. It's sort of, we sort of mash the tongue in. I'm going to take you, take you to the store. I'm going to take you to the, take me to the ball game. Take, take, ta, 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 ta. We sort of just jam it in there and we're not really making it separate. <clears throat> but the cerebral sounds, the these da ta da da na, this is closer probably to what we might say in English. Um, now there's an interesting connection also between um yeah, now like, yes, manjishta, manjishta is actually using the, uh, the cerebral, the murdhanya form of ta, ta. That's their ta, it's this guy, it's this one with breath in manjishta. Now, interestingly, there are connections you will always see if there is the, if you see the S with a dot under it, like in, in manjishta, you're, it's always going to be followed by the T with a dot under it. That is actually a rule of Sunday. It's always going to be that way. The same thing happens whenever you have an R, R, we're going to use this N after it. There is also a rule that covers that. And think about it, N, this N, is pronounced with the tongue against the alveolar ridge. And where do you pronounce ra? Well, we're going to talk about that. That ra, this ra, is a little flap. It's more like the Spanish uh, riqueza. It's more like that ra. It's not like r. You know, in English, especially in uh, areas of uh, the United States where many people came from Germany, people came up with a very unique way of saying their R. R is very guttural. And I've, I found this more in places uh, like in you know, parts of the US. In England, people will say very, very, this, I am, I, am uh, I, I speak very properly, very, 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 very. So that R, that R is closer to the Sanskrit R. Um, it's it's a short flap, and also the ra in Spanish, uh, like in riqueza, riches, uh, in Spanish, that is also like the Sanskrit ra. But anyway, there's a connection there. Okay, so yes, the manjishta is that form of the murdanya ta with breath. Now, 
The thing that's a little different are the dentals or dantia. Ta, ta, da, da, na. The tongue goes against the tip of the top row of front teeth. Okay, let me say that again. Um, They are going against the tip of the top row of front teeth. That is a softer sound. It is not like the usual sound in English. Now these, ta, 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 da, da, na, these are used more frequently than ta, ta, da, da, na. The difference, the distinction between ta, ta, da, da, na and ta, ta, da, da, na is a little subtle. It can be a little hard to pick up on. But, um, you know, you have a little bit of a reprieve there because Sanskrit does not have the number, because Hindi has a combination of Sanskrit-derived words and words that come from Old Persian, Arabic, um, and um, and other, other sources as well. Um, <clears throat> there are many words in Hindi that are only distinguished by whether it's in the Murdhanya or Dantya group. Sanskrit actually does not have much confusion there. There are not a lot of words where if you say it using the wrong one of these, somebody's going to know you're not saying it right, but they will at least know what you're saying. And you're not going to accidentally be uttering a, a curse word that will have aunties blushing and and giving you dirty looks and, um, you know, making you all turn red in the face because you realize that you just said something that was a complete social malaprop. So, ta, ta, da, da, na. Now, that, th those are against the tip of the teeth. They are softer sounds. They, are, they don't come out quite as loudly as these. Um, so, these are, these are more foreign sounds, and these are the more common um, uh, consonants that are used in Sanskrit rather than the Murdhanya group. Finally, you have the labials or Aushtya. Pa, pa, ba, ba, ma. Now, one of the things that you want to practice so that you've got these, this little neat little table, it's like a, a little bingo chart. You've got five rows and you've got five columns. You've got your hard with no breath hard with breath, soft with no breath, soft with breath, and the nasal. So trying to say the consonants without breath is actually very hard because our habit in English is that we always use breath. Um, would you like some cake? We're not saying cake. We're saying cake. We, to say cake is a different thing. It's something that's completely different. I'm going to change. When we say change, we're putting a lot of breath into that. Change. Cha, 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 cha. Making the distinction is tough. Here's a little exercise you can do that helps. It especially, it's hardest with these labials. Try to say pa. Put your hand in front of your mouth and say pa, 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 pa. Put your hand right up in front of your lips. And when you say pa, Try to not make breath come on your fingers. Is it hard or is it not? It's very hard. It takes practice. Now, pa and then pa. Just let it come out and you should feel the breath blow on your fingers. Pa, 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 pa. Trying to not make the breath come out on that first one is very tough, but you can practice it. Fingers in front of the mouth is a very good exercise. The same thing is true. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, ba. These are different sounds. One has no breath, the other has breath. And finally, ma. Well, it's really hard to go wrong on that. Ma, ma. Semi-vowels. These are related to the vowels. Ya is related to i. Ra is related to ri. La is related to ri. And va is related to u. Um, all very simple. The only difference is 
that ra, as I mentioned before, it's more like the Spanish ra in riqueza, not like the um, not like the r in perro. Um, it's not a trilled r. It's like a single little flap. Okay, like in uh, in in perro, but not perro dog in Spanish. So in Sanskrit, it's just ra. Um, just a single flap, a single flick of the tongue against the alveolar ridge. Now the sibilants. Let's talk about the sibilants. They're all hissing and waiting to get your attention. You have this. First, I'm going to talk about this sh, this s with a dot under it. That's actually the easiest one. It's just like the sh in she sells seashells down by the seashore. So. Sha sa, sha sa, very easy, no problem. This sha is actually halfway in between sha and sa. So sha sa, sha sa, sha, sha, sha. It's halfway in between. It's halfway to being sha. Okay. So the 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 first one sha is halfway between sha and sa. The second one, sh, is like a familiar sh sound, like she sells. And then sa is like the s in snake. Very simple. Aspirate, ha. Huh. Very easy. Ha, 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 ha. Let's have a good laugh because now we're done with all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> well, not really. Almost done. I just have... Two little things. You'll see th these Vyanjana Yogas sometimes. You'll sometimes see um, the uh, Gya when you have J and then this N with a squiggle over it. That's the uh, Talavyana. It is pronounced like Gya. So, for example, uh, Gyana, as in Gyanendriyas. That is this combination. And then Ksha. You will sometimes see, um, for example, kshama, forbearance, um, you know, and, and so forth. Um, kshut, for hunger. Um, it's ksha, as you might expect. It's fairly straightforward. And that's it. Um, for further resources, um, I have, I am continuously updating this. We have just been finishing up a massive, um, you know, it, it doesn't look like much when you look at Sanskrit editing, but actually getting all the diacritics in place and bringing these all things, everything to reference is a lot of work. And there's been a lot of recent changes and I'm continuing to update this page. This is my Sanskrit resources page on our website um, in nayaayurveda.com slash Sanskrit dash resources. I have things like guide to diacritics, tools for people who are trying to write things with Sanskrit words. Also, there's a pronunciation guide there. Um, right now, it's a very simple pronunciation guide. Eventually, I will incorporate the, the more detailed pronunciation information in this presentation there. So I thank you very much. We are um, going to be covering Sanskrit and Jyotish in these sessions. Um, I hope that was interesting, and I hope that was something that, that helps to put this in context. Um, you know, regardless of whether you want to just know enough to not feel like you are drowning, or, um, you know, whether you actually uh, want to go on with a serious study of Sanskrit, I hope this puts it in context. Um, if you are already a native speaker of Indic languages, and, um, you know, this all seemed like it was very redundant or silly or, or, or whatever. You can forgive me, please. Um, but I did want to try to frame everything and put it all in context. So I thank you very much and look forward to next week. Um, we may want to alternate with a one hour session, may alternate between uh, doing Jyotish and doing Sanskrit. We'll work that out and I will follow up with assignments on the forum. I would say for now, 
please let's try practicing your pronunciation. You may already have perfect pronunciation um, and that's not a problem. If not, try to practice it and we will, in our next session, we'll start with doing a little review and I'm gonna have all of you speak. So try to make sure you have a microphone um, and I'm not gonna mute everybody when you start. So you'll be able to actually say, and we'll just do a little review there and maybe do a little interaction and see how you say everything. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop the recording there.